Good evening and welcome. I'm Maureen Vosberg, the Development Director at Cornerstones Community Partnerships, and I have the distinct pleasure this evening of introducing you to the Via Nueva Tapestry. The tapestry is a very unique art form safely ensconced in Our Lady of Guadalupe Church in Via Nueva, New Mexico. And I'm here this evening to tell you the story. I became acquainted with the tapestry two years ago when I made a personal mission of going to see the tapestry in Via Nueva. I called Melly Gonzalez, who is the business manager of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and arranged for her to give me a tour. And when I entered the church, I was truly amazed. It's absolutely incredible. And I came away from my visit thinking, I would really like to be involved doing something to preserve the tapestry. And when I discussed it with Cornerstones, they also thought it was an absolutely wonderful project because it fits into our mission of preserving cultural landscapes. In the 1970s, a Chilean woman by the name of Carmen Benevente de Ortega y Salas conducted six stitchery workshops in the state of New Mexico, and one of them was in Via Nueva. From that, the women had such a good time participating that the parish priest, who was then Father Hassenfuss, said, well, why don't you do another project? Perhaps you would like to do something for the bicentennial of the United States in 1976. The women thought this was a wonderful idea, and they set about making plans to create the tapestry, tell the story of the Via Nueva Valley and their Spanish heritage. As the tapestry nears its 50th birthday, having been completed in 1976, it is in remarkably good condition, but it has never been professionally cleaned. And that is the intention of Cornerstones, to clean the tapestry and preserve it for history. Another factor is that only half of the stitchers remain with us, and we wish to honor those women while they are still alive and their heirs as well. Join us for the rest of the story. First of all, I love that Cornerstones is doing this project because we mostly know of Cornerstones as preserving buildings and structures. And if you think about the churches of New Mexico, if you think about the history of New Mexico and small village life, um, the church is a center of those communities, but the people are the church. And so the, the fact that you have this story inside of the church that tells about people's experience is extraordinary. The fact that uh, we have this document uh, you know, researchers like myself are used to going to an archive, looking at a book, you know, pulling out paper. This is a creative document that has a life and an energy. It's imbued with the love and belief and community of a village. And that's a different kind of document that is so rare. Um, you know, so many of the small villages across New Mexico, you know, these were self-sustaining, resourceful communities that survived on the frontier through many, many changes over time. As life progressed, many of them sort of got written into irrelevance. And I really believe that this document, this artistic gem, uh, is, is continuing to say we're relevant. We're in a small village, 36 women have been tasked with explaining their way of life and their history and their centuries in this place. I worked in 1991. I did some brief interviews in preparation uh, to do some writing on this project. But I did get to meet a couple of the women stitchers then. Um, one was Isadora Flores, who was really sort of one of the, the main people that went out to find. Uh, she was in the original group of, of stitchers who had worked with the Museum of International Folk Art on the embroidery project. And then it turned into a bigger project and she and her, her niece, I believe, Rosabel Gallegos, uh, were the ones that said, okay, we will 
will take on this bigger project. And um, they went into the communities to go and find other stitchers to participate. And when I spoke with these two women way back when, I, I'll always remember because Isadora said to me, you know, we did this not because we're artists, um, because we want to make sure that the next generation remembers. And so this, this project had this group of women take pause and do their own research. And I think they realized that they knew so much more just intuitively and through experience um, than they would have thought at the beginning of the project. And as uh, Isadora said, you know, when, when we got tasked with this, I couldn't sleep for many, many nights because all of a sudden I said it was 265 feet of this project that we have to do and I was so nervous and I just didn't think we could do it. It just seemed overwhelming. And then Rosavelle started talking about this story of one stitcher who she says maybe wasn't as, as well versed or as practiced as everybody else and who she came up with this incredible design and it was like the Virgin, Our Lady, who they have great faith in, who's the, the patroness of their, of their church, Our Lady of Guadalupe, um, as if she had taken the needle and stitched it herself. By the time all is said and done with this project, I would, I would really refer to it as a, as a tapestry of memory, a tapestry of memory, of identity and experience, and of emotion. It's a document that tells the stories of the ancestors because these women went to their elders in their communities and those elders were remembering the stories that their elders had told them. And all of these stories that had been passed down through generations suddenly were in the hands of these women. And um, the common thread, if you will, is the story. And they all told an incredible story of their own that meant something to them. We got together and we decided it has to be a continuous uh, thing, you know. Uh, first it's the good earth and then it goes on to uh, Indian paradise and on, so on till we got to where we were at at the time. So we made a rough sketch and we had to measure to see how long the panels would uh, be. It, it was like a, like a pattern that we had to um, develop and people just chose what they liked the most according to the title of the panel. And so we got the ladies to start working and we worked every Thursday for two years. I would go buy the yarn if we ran out of a certain color. I can't even remember where I got it. I know it was in Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. It was Persian yarn. So what we did, I would go get the, the different shades needed. I had to take that number and, and, and buy whatever we needed. Anyhow, um, it's interesting how sometimes the shades were slightly different. Not exactly the same number, but pretty close. There was this lady, and she passed away, poor, bless her soul. She, uh, she's the one that uh, plastered the church. Back then, they used to plaster the church. There was no cement, no, no rock uh, on the walls. And uh, she went and she, she said, she told me one day, uh, you know what, Rose? I didn't get the same shade of, of uh, brown because it was supposed to be mud, you know, and uh, the local clay. Anyhow, she said, it's not the same shade. I don't feel comfortable with it. Should I take it off and maybe find the same shade? No, I told her, I love it. You know why? Because the dark was showing that it was freshly plastered. The lighter was, it was drying, and then the lightest was very dry. So I said, no, this is the... Uh, a process, I know, it's, it's like step by step. So everybody agreed, and I thought it was great. I am Isidora Madrid de Flores. My parents were Mr. and Mrs. Fulgencio Madrid. They were one of the first, from the first settlers in Villanueva, Spanish descent. And I, we had just the eighth grade education. When I first started with my thing, I started sketching. I have never been good at anything as far as sketching is concerned. My deer got about two feet long and the horns were <laughs> something. Uh, 
So I got my grandson and he helped me. He, he did real good and I did some of it. As you can see from one of my rabbits has only one eye. The other, uh, there you can see <laughs> a lot of things that are out of proportion. And uh, it has three things in my uh, panel. It has uh, the winter where you can see the snow. It's melting down into the Pecos River. And then there's the spring. You can see the flowers coming and the birds coming in. And then you can see a hailstorm. There's a big fire that the hailstorm, thunderstorm caused it. And then you can see um, the birds. The, you can see in the river that we have fish. In my borderline, you can see grapes because we were supposed, that's what Carmen asks is that you can put anything of your native things that you have here. You can put ecclesiastical things so you can find uh, the cattle where you made atole, the urna where you made bread, the log where you use the axe to, to chop the wood, the altar with the cross, the metate where you grounded the corn for the tortillas, the basket, which was the basket of the miracle that our Lord fed the people with. The chalice, and you can see the crescent moon. You can see the holy year beneath, which is a white dove, 1975. Well, I think what I enjoyed more is getting together and, uh, you know, just talking, being ourselves. I think that was the most important thing because, you know, we have three young girls, which my granddaughter was visiting me. And she, I paid her dues and I said, let's go. And I really thought, you know, that I was going to have a time with her. I said, uh, she won't do her embroidery. And she got the penny pin piece. And uh, she had a bigger piece than me and she really has done everything and really worked. I was then told that there was some project going on at the church. So naturally I came down to see what was going on at the church. They told me they were gonna do this embroidery, this project uh, and for the bicentennial that was coming up that in a couple of years. And uh, as they asked me if I would be interested and I said, yes. And they said, well, we have this, subjects that are left and I said fine and there was the one up there behind the sanctuary and uh, I chose that one that was for um, El Cerrito which is the one I did up there then uh, they said well we have another one that we don't know who's going to be able to do it. And it was for the uh, the Archbishop of Santa Fe that was then. Uh, so I said, OK, you know, it was Sanchez. And um, I said, I'll do it. Then uh, Rosabelle told me, well, we have two pieces. We can't find anybody that wants to to volunteer to do it, do you want to do it? And I said, what are those? And it was the fortification of La Cuesta, and the other one was coming of Coronado. So I landed up with those four panels. Uh, I did the, the drawing for the fortification of La Cuesta, and my, grand, my mother, Dolores Garcia, that was the daughter of Lucio Torres that lived in El Cerrito. And she did all the embroidery on that. And I'm telling you, I don't envy her because it's a long wall. <laughs> and she would tell me, I'm still working on my wall. I'm still working on my wall. We um, became involved. We had to... Uh, raised some money because we did have to put some some of the money because the, it was an endowment for the arts. And 
Yvonne Lange was the one that was in charge of it, and Thompson was the supervisor. And we had, we had a lot of people that were interested and were able to help the project. Like the, the home spawn was given to us by that lady from um, California. And then we had, of course, all the yarn, the Persian yarn. And uh, we had our subjects and we started working on them. I started doing all my research. I am a history buff. So I knew all the story about the villages and I knew the story of El Cerrito. My grandfather is also shown there uh, going in the wagon because he used to deliver the mail from Villanueva to El Cerrito and has a little wagon there and it's shown at the end there. Okay, my name is Chisa Sena. I'm in ninth grade and my grandmother, well, she got me going on it. And what's your name? Isidora Flores. Okay. And on my tapestry, okay, my, the title of my tapestry is the Penitentes. And the Penitentes were people who used to punish themselves and do penance during Holy Week. Starting at the left hand side of my embroidery is a uh, village where people used to go to the Morada. The Morada is where the people used to gather to offer their prayers for their sins during Holy Week. Next, there are three ladies and one man praying the rosary. The Carreta del Muerto is next. Muerte. <laughs> Carreta del Muerte means wagon of death. Whenever one of the penitentes would fall, they would go on the Carreta. On the side of the road going up the hill are 14 crosses. They signify the stations of the cross. Then there are penitentes along the side of the road. They whip themselves during Holy Week. Then there are three men at the top of the hill. One is carrying a small cross, one is carrying a book, and one is carrying a larger cross. The building at the very top of the hill is a morada. You can see the blood dripping from the penitentes, whips, and their backs. We got together and, and, and had a list of things that we could do, you know, like, um, when we would get together as a group, on a, like an, when we all got together as a group, and they said, you can pick whatever you want and then think about what would be historical, you know, like what took place in this village and stuff. And my husband and one of my panels, which is the one at the very end of the church to the left, is the, uh, in, in Spanish is the Corrida del Gallo, and where they would pluck the rooster from the ground. And my husband's family did it all their lives. So, and, and his oldest brother, one of the brothers, would win it every year because he was so big and tall. And so they used to do that a lot here in Geneva. I, that's why I picked that one. Art conservation is a complex field that requires training in studio art, art history, and material science. Studies generally involve several years of internships, even after completing graduate studies. I was fortunate to start my career with a high school internship at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. My colleague, Jack Towns, an exhibit designer and preparator, joining us on this project, also got his first glimpse of the opportunities of an arts career when visiting museums while in college. It is through my role as an art conservator that Maureen Vosberg of Cornerstones first contacted me and got me involved in the tapestry preservation project. The term tapestry, in this case, has been used to refer to the assemblage of embroidered panels that grace the walls of the church at Villanueva. Jack and I have worked on many interesting projects over our careers. Jack and I regularly work with a variety of exhibit projects in the Northwest and Southwest, and I've even done a stint at the Vatican Museums in Rome. While I've been fortunate to work with many different kinds of textile conservation projects, from work on archaeological textiles from sites like Mesa Verde National Park to conserving Native American textiles for the Smithsonian, no project has held my heart like this one. My mom passed away four years ago, but when I walked into the Villa Nueva Church, I knew that she would have wanted me to do this project. She was a seamstress herself and would have loved to see the work done by the women of Villa Nueva. 
The tapestry was created as part of a bicentennial grant project in conjunction with the Museum of International Folk Art. The museum staff understood the preservation of textiles and helped the women of Villanueva acquire high quality materials that would allow them to create a tapestry that would last into the future. They chose a pure cotton fabric for the background and Persian wool yarns that would retain their colors over time for the embroidery. While the tapestry is protected by the walls of the church, the tapestry is open to the air. It is not encased in glass or covered in plexiglass as might be done with other works of art to protect them. In fact, in this case, covering the embroidered panels from the front might cause environmental issues to adversely affect them in other ways. Also, while the tapestry is museum quality, the tapestry is not owned or held by a museum, so different criteria is in place for protecting it. This is a community church, and although the tapestry is an important icon, it's also important that the tapestry not be removed from the community presence in any sense. Our preservation plan for the tapestry really began with an examination of the tapestry and research into its history. When Jack and I examined the Villanueva tapestry, we found that although from a distance the tapestry retains its color and brightness, the surface of a number of the panels had a fine coating of soot. We learned that in the past, the church had been heated with a wood stove, and at one point there had been a fire in the church. Fortunately, all of the embroidered panels survived the fire, in part by the fast thinking of the local community who removed some of the panels to save them from the flames. But not all of the panels escaped soot damage. These small particulates of dust, dirt, and soot are acidic, and over time, if left on the tapestry, will weaken the fabric and discolor it. If surface cleaning could be accomplished, this would remove the soot, which would minimize the aging that could be caused by leaving damaging soot and soil particulates on the fabric. On a second trip to Villanueva, Jack and I tested the surface of the embroidered panels in several different ways to investigate the extent of the soot damage and to evaluate various cleaning techniques. Through testing, we found that the panels above the altar had especially suffered from deposited soot. To do the tests, we used a variety of soft brushes and tried and true museum surface cleaning pads and sponges to assess the amount and distribution of the soiling. We tested small locations and compared the cleaning effectiveness of each material. We also used a micro camera to inspect the area behind the panels. Phew, cozy home to a few spiders. But we didn't see any moth activity, which was a good sign. Fortunately, the church is diligently cleaned, which minimizes any activity by insect pests. And our proposed treatment includes enacting techniques of cleaning that will get behind the tapestry panels to clean out the interstices that are hard to reach otherwise. The proposal we presented to Cornerstones is to clean all of the panels in place. Each panel will have photographic documentation done before the treatments begin. Portable lights will be used during treatment to assure that the cleaning occurs to the just right point and that no panels are overcleaned, which can cause unnatural light spots. It can be a delicate balance and where a fair amount of experience doing this type of cleaning plays in. We expect the work to take a number of weeks. The cleaning is a methodical process requiring a number of steps, starting with mounting a screen over the tapestry and vacuuming with a minimum of pressure. We'll use tried and true museum techniques that are acceptable for cleaning valuable and fragile museum quality items. Once the extensive surface cleaning has been completed, only periodic light vacuuming through screens should be required. The tapestries will be examined periodically to determine whether this light vacuuming will be required on an annual basis or maybe less often. Speaking of practice and training, this project also includes a plan to train two community interns in the process. The church has selected two young women, both who live in the Villa Nueva Valley, 
to participate in the internships. These young women will be mentored by our current crew so that they can be trained to accomplish some of the annual maintenance tasks and monitoring that will help to preserve the tapestry. My name is Michaela Gallegos. I live near the outside, near Vienueva. I've been involved with the church since I was five years old, been coming to church since I was real little. The tapestry kind of like tells the history of Vienueva and they're more like stories to me in art form. So ever since I was little, we would come to church and I would always look at the tapestry and think of it as part of my heritage. By helping restore the tapestry and keeping it alive, not only is it important to me, but to the ladies who also made the tapestry, and also it's basically our history throughout here in Bayam Weva. I would like to keep that alive and burning through all future generations. My name is Marsha Wolf and I was the founder and the trustee of the Barbara Erdman Foundation. When Maureen told me about the tapestries in Villanueva, I was really quite surprised that I had never heard of them before. Barbara actually, um, one, of the, one of the most fun things that she had when she lived in Europe was to go around and look at all the storytelling tapestries. This whole thing really complements uh, Barbara, the foundation, and what these wonderful women in Villanueva did. When I see that these women in Villanueva wanted to do the same thing with the history of their community and their uh, people, it really touched my heart. And I know that if Barbara had been alive, she would have been touched too. I knew that the foundation was a perfect place to uh, use its money to make sure that this cornerstone project um, was able to get started and to restore those pieces. Donating to this Cornerstone project would really, really cement these women's legacies. Thank you. The first time I saw this tapestry, I didn't know what it meant actually. But over the years, in fact, within the first one week, I came back, opened the church. When people are not there anymore, I looked at that, and that is when I saw it is a journey, you know, leading to God. And it is something, I really appreciated it, is something that the community themselves did. But then for the preservation, I thank you so much. I'm so, so appreciative of that. May God continue to bless you guys and also bless the donors. Thank you all for attending and listening to the Villanueva Tapestry Story. I hope you found it as interesting and as exciting as I do, and that you will support it. There are many people I would like to thank who have been with us along the path or on our journey to preserve the tapestry. I'm going to cite three in particular, but I hope that our list of credits will include all of the others who've been very, very helpful. I first would like to thank Brian Graney. Of the, he is the archivist at the Museum of International Folk Art. I would also like to thank Bernadette Lucero, who is the archivist at the Archdiocese of Santa Fe and Lastly, and very importantly, Melly Gonzalez, the business manager at Our Lady of Guadalupe. Melly has been my liaison, my business partner, and now my friend. Thank you all. I would like to thank our very generous sponsors as well. The Barbara Erdman Foundation, the Catholic Foundation, Thornburg Investment Management, and Phyllis Lundberg. We would not be at the point we are without you. Thank you tremendously. Now, if you're wondering how you might support this, you can write a check and send it to Cornerstones at Post Office Box 2341, Santa Fe, New Mexico, 
or you can go directly to our website, seastones.org, and donate. In either instance, please indicate that your gift is for the Tapestry Project. And when COVID is no longer with us, please call Millie and arrange a tour of the Tapestry in the charming Our Lady of Guadalupe Church. I and we thank you tremendously for being with us.